Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. History that we all learned and are still learning is based on some rather straightforward principles. Usually there are dates, places, names followed by a description of events of what preceded and what the consequences were. Not necessarily in that order, but somewhat along those lines. I'm not a historian, Maybe that is why it amuses me to see how some segments of not so recent history are brought to us in a very precise way, while some other of a not so distant history are still pretty sketchy. And we accept them both almost without any objection, most of us at least. May I offer an example? Ancient history, and that of Rome particularly, are examined almost in detail year after year from the birth of the eternal city to the end of the classical era. And then things become a bit less orderly. The time span for historical observations is much wider. And when the history of my people and that of the region where we live are concerned, for quite some time it goes by huge leaps through centuries, from the 7th to the 11th, or even to the 12th century. Similar blanks were, were there in later history as well, filled occasionally by great powers, empires of all kinds, conquerors that ravaged through this part of Europe. And for all the troubles they caused, and even more in rooted to last almost forever, they usually accused the people of the Balkans, usually in a cynical imperial way. Uh, everybody remembers Sir Winston Churchill's statement that Balkans produces more history than they can consume. In spite of all that, we managed to keep alive our own historic memory of events, leaders, or decisions that were important to us, against all odds. And Emperor Constantine the Great encompasses all these, all things necessary for our historic memory. When I chose the topic, religious tolerance, 17 centuries of the Milan Edict, I had to answer the question, what is so special about Constantine to be called the Great and to make him stand out after so many years? Of course, there were other elements that played a significant role. First, the fact that the author of the Edict, or co-author to be precise, together with Latsinis, Emperor Constantine was born in my country. But so were 16 other Roman emperors. Actually, more Roman emperors were born only in Rome itself. And four of those were born in the city of Nish, Nisus of those days. Second, that just last year we celebrated 1,700 years of the promulgation of the Milan Edict, and that whole of the year 2013 was in my country dedicated to the memory of Constantine with numerous cultural and religious events. From operas dedicated to the great Roman emperor to holy liturgies in his honor served by patriarchs, cardinals, archbishops, with high level political presence in all occasions. Decisive point was the fact that in Milan Edict we have for the first time on European soil promulgation of religious tolerance. Emperor Constantine is the founder of a new era an era of the establishment of religious freedoms as an integral part of basic human rights. And that document keeps that necessary time span unbroken from antiquity till modern times. From the centuries that mark the sunset of the Roman Empire to the dawn of the new civilization that we all are proud to be part of. In the Edict of Milan, Const of Milan Constantine had mentioned that he gives freedom free power of decision, to Christians and to all. So everyone could be the follower of the religion he wants, or that everyone, as he expresses himself later in the book, is allowed to believe as his heart wishes. This Constantine's expression is of use for me as an incentive to point out the importance of the principle of religious freedom, in other words, the respect of full religious freedom and freedom of conscience. This principle we usually connect to modern times. Most of our contemporaries, even very well-informed intellectuals, 
think that the freedom of belief and the freedom of conscience are the achievements of the French Revolution and time afterwards. However, we can see that it, it is Emperor Constantine who proclaimed this principle. Historians are trying to explain the coming of Milan Edict in many different ways, and I don't intend to venture into any of that, simply because it all makes sense, but somehow omits to express the most important of all. There were, all those centuries ago, many various documents signed by various emperors and the very Emperor Constantine as well, but they had no strength or vision of bringing into the life of mankind such radical changes that would enable the transformation of society and the world of, as a whole. Only one, the Edict of Tolerance that the year 313 AD promulgated in the city of Milan constituted foundation for the development of the modern time concept of the free will and the freedom of choice. Constantine didn't just sign one document. He, by the power of his will and uncompromising decisiveness of the ruler forced his contemporary to respect and implement what was promulgated. His decision of epical proportions, let everybody believe as his heart tells him, lies in the foundation of all religious and civic liberties this, till our days. It appears that this quite broad-minded message, civilized and conciliatory, but also deeply ingenious, was built into the very foundation of modern European culture and humanity. In today's Serbia, the 1700th anniversary of the Edict of Milan, the Constantine anniversary, was celebrated in a sign of victory of understanding and tolerance among people and religions. It is that part of the Edict of Milan that was given prominence and primary importance in numerous spiritual, cultural, and scientific events in the 2013 in my country. Thus, it is not by chance that for the organization of the celebrations, all religious communities in Serbia took part. <coughs> this communion, communion is of utmost importance because it develops democratic achievements of the society. It strengthens mutual understanding among people and contributes to the promotion of tolerance. In his address to the guests of the central celebration of the 17th centuries of the Edict of Milan, the President of the Republic of Serbia pointed out that with this document, the system of values was established, which since its adoption until the end of the world applies to every Christian and also to every human being, regardless of religion. Serbia is honored that this anniversary is celebrated in our country as well. We still live by the principles of the Edict of Milan. Serbia's people have guaranteed freedom of confession or the right to follow and believe without being disturbed. This is not a demonstration of a culture of remembering, but a true tribute to one of the greatest documents of civilization, the president said. Our history was not an easy one, not easy at all, neither the ancient nor the recent one. Serbian people through centuries of existence faced numerous challenges. We have managed to overcome the most difficult situations and survive physically, spiritually, and remain faithful to our civilization, religious, and cultural roots. Without tolerance and dialogue, there is no reconciliation, reconciliation and without lasting peace, there is no regaining of confidence which is necessary to overcome the consequences of the conflicts in this part of Europe at the end of the last century. Interfaith dialogue allows the true hope and reconciliation to return. Serbia is in this spirit with full respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity and mutual respect among countries in the region, working to overcome the negative legacy of the past, building a just, democratic and prosperous society. In the epistle of the Serbian Orthodox Church on the 17th anniversary, 1700 uh, anniversary of the Edict of Milan. On June 11, 2013, it is said about Constantine the Great that never did any emperor before him and rarely any after him raise the knowledge of God and the knowledge of man to such a level. For freedom is the foundation of the existence of all mankind. The emperor knew and saw that force Neither helps one to believe or not believe simply because someone decreed it. He knew that no society would survive unless it allows every citizen that which is basic, faith, sincerity, and freedom. 
In his head, Constantine was more modern and more noble than many of the rulers who came after him or who govern today. Freedom of religion is the foundation of all other values, of all civilizations and cultures which consider valuable res respect for the human person and which live by it. We seek neither today nothing more nor less than that which the Roman emperor and later saint made clear 1700 years ago. But it is a basic fact that man needs to be free to believe and confess as his heart desires and his conscience dictates, hindered by no one. It was not so long ago that this was not possible. There are places not too far from us where this is still not possible. In the apostolic encyclical Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, His Holiness Pope Francis said, evangelization also involves the path of dialogue which opens the church to collaboration with other political, social, religious, and cultural spheres. Ecumenism is an indispensable path to evangelization. Mutual enrichment is important. We can learn so much from one another. In the book co-authored with Rabbi Abraham Skorka called On Heaven and Earth, Pope Francis says, dialogue is born from an attitude of respect for the other person, from a conviction that the other person has something good to say. It assumes that there is room in the heart of the person's point of view, opinion, and proposal. To dialogue entails a cordial reception, not a prior condemnation. In order to dialogue, it's necessary to know how to lower the defenses, open the doors of the house, and often human warmth. Ladies and gentlemen, comparing contemporary international protection of the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and with them a related right to freedom of opinion and expression, the content of the Edict of Milan, we can realize their exceptional closeness preserved in principle to ensure religious freedom of every man if he respects other people's religiosity. And this is done both at the individual and at the collective level, level of religious communities. The first such international form of protection occurs in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights formed in 1948, which in Article 18 states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. The right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Mm -hmm. His Eminence Bishop of Bačka Irineos interprets Milan Edict in even broader scope. I quote, today we discuss Europe, its enlargement, foundations of its already given unity and recently tasked merging its values and standards, its culture and the sources of, the, of that culture, the relation of general European identity and the identity of the nation's members of the European family, as well as other important topics. And it seems like we forget that the idea of Europe's unity, the idea of the universality of the Christian world, ecumena, cultural world, orbis terrarum, versus the unknown world of the barbarian peoples and different cultures, as well as the idea of universal, the unity. Historically, it is far and away older than the concept reached in the form of a modern European Union, and that a modern is, in other words, a trendy vision of a global village. We could even claim that the Ecumene of that time was in certain way more comprehensive and more successful than today's European Union. It enclosed the whole wider Mediterranean basin on three continents the biggest part of the European area, Front Asia and North Africa, and in spite the existence of many different nations, languages, cults and cultures, it manifested stronger spiritual and civilizational unity than the one that we in Europe at the beginning of the 21st century take as a praiseworthy. The end of the quote. Ladies and gentlemen, without tolerance and interfaith dialogue, there is no reconciliation, and without lasting peace, there is no regaining of confidence which is necessary to form the consequences of the numerous conflicts in many con corners of the world, many in the name of faith. At the first glance, rather paradoxical seems the fact that those who with the deepest sincerity participate in religious conflicts usually 
don't know the differences between religious teachings in whose name they fight and religious teachings, teachings against which they fight. It is not difficult to reach conclusive evidences that the real reason of the conflicts is often something else and religious differences are simply used as an instrument. However, it is quite disheartening that the differences in the religious affiliation are recognized as a suitable tool for inducing fanaticism. It is particularly odd when this fanaticism is positioned against the values promoted in these religions, values such as tolerance, forgiveness, equality of man, fighting egoism, pride, etc. In the conclusions from the International Conference, Everlasting Value and Permanent Actuality of the Edict of Milan that took place in the city of Nish, it is said, Correct understanding of the ideas of the Edict of Milan could significantly contrib contribute to resolve some of the most complex issues of the contemporary man, such as absence of unrestricted right to religious freedom, jeopardizing or insufficient protection of human rights, lack of social justice, permanent devastation of peace in the world. Having in mind the importance and scope of the questions raised, all subjects of social life should act responsibly in the future integral dialogue, state institutions, churches and religi religious communities, as well as organizations of the civil society. Thank you.